Okay, hi everyone. Um, and good afternoon and welcome to the Leibniz Institute for Research on Society and Space. My name is Matthias Bernd and I'm working as the senior researcher, the acting head of the research department for regeneration of cities at the IRS and I will moderate this event. Uh, this is the 18th International Lecture on Society and Space and we invited Tuna Tashan Koch from the University of Amsterdam and we will talk today about the fragmented governance architecture of contemporary urban development. Um, why this topic today? As most of you will be aware, housing shortages and the lack of affordability have become a new normality in, in many cities across the globe. And one consequence of this is that there is a call for more private initiative in housing construction and also for more partnerships with the private sector to, live, to deliver the housing needed. Yet at the same time, many of these private developments and many of these partnerships come together with frustrations uh, because of a lack of affordability um, experienced in many of these projects, design problems, ecological aspects and other issues. So the question emerges why uh, these projects, these partnerships are not governed in a more coherent way and adequate way, which would lead to better outputs. Um, and against this background, I think that we face um, quite a number of recent research contributions which, which dig deeper into the actual governance patterns under which these uh, housing developments appear. And within that context, I think Tuna Tashan Kok, whom we invited, uh, is one of the leading researchers. And we found her idea of fragmented governance architectures as being the outcome of uh, a growing complexity of institutional organizational arrangements and market driven developments. We found this idea very uh, stimulating. So uh, we thought we would invite her as a main speaker and feel very privileged that Tuna accepted this invitation and is going to deliver a lecture now. For those of you who don't know Tuna yet, um, just some words to introduce her. Um, Tuna Tashan Kok is an urban social geographer and planner. She is professor of urban governance and planning at the University of Amsterdam in the Faculty of Social and Behavioral Sciences. And at the same time, she holds an honor, honorary professorship at the University College of London at the Bartlett School of Planning. Her research is mainly focused on themes of urban governance on property led urban development dynamics um, and on spatial organizations through social relations. Uh, Tuna has uh, initiated, coordinated, and led uh, quite a number of internationally and locally funded research projects. And I think with, in the context in which we meet today, uh, the most interesting project for me at least is an open research area funded research project called What is Governed in Cities, uh, WIG, which studies uh, the complex governance dynamics in residential property development in Amsterdam, London, and Paris. Uh, Tuna is also the founder and chair of uh, YouGovern, which is an urban governance research network uh, that aims to you know, build connections between different researchers doing governance studies. And uh, it this network has an online presence. And I will copy the link uh, into the chat in a few minutes. Um, I'm not going to enumerate all the publications from Tuna uh, that are authored by Tuna, but I just want to point you to a recent book, uh, which she co-authored with Guy Baton, uh, that is called Contradictions of Neoliberal Planning, Cities, Policies and Politics, and I highly recommend having a look into it. Um, we also invited a second speaker uh, as a discussant. Uh, this is Professor uh, Laura Kalbe Elias from the University of Stuttgart, and I'm particularly happy that we can meet Laura here again. Uh, because Laura used to be a colleague working at our department uh, until October last year. Um, just a few words on Laura too. Laura studied architecture um, in Barcelona and Berlin and uh, later on in planning Berlin too at the Technical University and she wrote um, an excellent dissertation uh, on speculative uh, production of urban space and then the financialization of property development in Berlin's inner city which uh, she finalized in 2017 with summa cum laude. Um, later on, 
uh, from 2020 to 2000, no, 2017 to 2020, Laura worked at our department, Regeneration of Cities at the IRS, uh, and as a guest professor for planning theory at the Brandenburg Technical University in Cottbus, um, and uh, as a guest professor for urban regional planning at the Technical University in Dortmund. Um, Laura um, does excellent research on urban governance and planning, uh, particularly with relation to uh, the idea of the public good in planning theory and practice. Um, today, as I already mentioned, she works as a professor at the University of Stuttgart, um, as a professor for theories and methods of urban planning, and she is also currently leading the Städtebau Institute. I'm not actually sure how you translate that into English, but I would say it's something like Urban Development, Property Development Institute. But Laura, I would leave that up to you. So thanks, Laura, to you too for accepting our invitation. Uh, we are very happy and feel privileged to have you both here. Um, we also have counted 77 participants of this webinar. I think that's a very good number. Uh, unfortunately, you won't be able to see each other at the screen. You will only be able to see the speaker and, and us, us three, actually. Um, the way we will proceed is the following. Uh, first, Tuna will speak for about 40, 45 minutes. Um, then we will give the floor to Laura, who will provide a few thoughts and comments and try to get the discussion started. And after this, we will have around 30, 35 minutes for questions and answers. Um, and the way you can join in then is the following. Uh, all microphones will be muted and all cameras are switched off, uh, but you can ask your questions uh, using the Q and A box uh, or F and E, no F and R, Fragen und Antworten. The Q and A box, which you can find at the lower part of your screen. Um, if you type in your questions there, I will get them. Uh, I will summarize them, bring them up, and moderate the discussion. Uh, a last word, I should say, is the lecture will be recorded and uploaded to our webpage. So you can, um, you will be able to see it again, uh, listen to it again, and you can also distribute it to friends and colleagues, use it in seminars, and so on and so forth. Um, so I will stop it here. Um, I'm looking forward to Tuna's talk, and Tuna, now the floor is up to you. Thank you very much, uh, Matthias, for this uh, kind invitation. Let's start with the most difficult part of this, to share my screen and make it correct. So, um, all right. So, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you very much for this kind invitation. Uh, I'm very happy and honored to be here in this virtual space, uh, although feeling really sorry for missing the opportunity to be in Erkner for this occasion. Um, I will talk about the institutional infrastructure behind the market-driven urban development in my lecture today. I will use results from an ongoing research, also Matthias referred, a uh, big project, uh, what is governed in cities, and a few publications in relation to it. I will use Amsterdam as a case to operationalize my conceptual framework in the background. In Amsterdam, space is limited due to the historical and water-oriented morphology. This is conducive to scattered spatial developments, of course, as you can observe it everywhere, these scattered developments are planned through incremental institutional relations. This form of physical development appears as a patchwork. Different areas have been developed without being connected to each other in the spatial structure and diverse style of city building emerges around the city. However, limited space is not the only reason behind this form of development. Fragmented spatial development is a typical aspect of the contemporary cities under neoliberal and market-driven forms of spatial governance. But I will not talk about these physical aspects today. I will actually focus on the underlying institutional infrastructure of this patchwork-like city building experience. 
I will do this by exploring the conditions and factors that have an effect on what I will call fragmented governance architectures. So the architecture here refers to the underlying institutional infrastructure of urban governance, and it has nothing to do with architecture of building or uh, spatial structures. Fragmentation is an essential characteristic of governance, of course. Under the neoliberal political economic ideology, uh, scholarly literature highlights several characteristics of contemporary urban governance, uh, entrepreneurial, market-oriented, privatized, and contractualized urban governance are referred as the underlying reason for this institutional fragmentation. In a dynamic policy environment where the number of interactions between institutions and governance actors increases, it is difficult to control new forms of public action. In fact, as I uh, listed here, several scholars perceive fragmentation as an institutional coordination problem. Some of them refers to complexities and dysfunctionalities. Here, concepts like municipal governance, new urban managerialism, urban diplomacy, and urban speculation are concepts used in relation to new forms of local governance in that respect. Within this framework, we can safely argue that fragmentation is very much related to organizational and political fragmentation. As I mentioned earlier, uh, fragmentation is visible through the scattered morphology of the urban space, and these spatial developments are operationalized through uncoordinated and complex institutional relations. Uncoordinated and sometimes contradictory institutional ties link public and private actors in these pro property production processes. Here, what triggers further institutional fragmentation is the diminished possibilities for local governments, municipalities to interlink these spatial interventions with the developments in the wider built environment. And I will talk about the reasons for that in the background. In a previous uh, research project on contractual governance, I looked into fragmented regimes of public accountability in this form of urban governance also uh, and in that project, we called fragmentation as the institutional complexity caused by increasingly diverse types of actors or organizations involved in contemporary urban development. These regulatory activities accommodate equally complex regimes of accountability, and they are quite difficult to follow. Although institutional fragmentation has been quite visible in the scholarly literature, the format of this fragmentation often remains unnoticed. It is also empirically understudied, in my view, due to the complexities of the regulatory infrastructures to study and to observe. In a recent publication, which is based on the What is Governed in Cities project, the WIC project, I focused on this very aspect together with my colleague, Sarah Özol. Today, uh, today's presentation, I will share with you some results from this research project based on the extensive policy analysis, interviews, and research trying to provide a wider picture of urban policy through its interconnections with the property market dynamics. Here, of course, what gained importance uh, to look is the institutional links between local governments, municipalities, and the property industry actors. We can observe these links through uncoordinated and usually contradictory institutional ties, forming a complex and chaotic landscape of regulations, contracts, actors, and relations. What is behind these activities is a complex set of regulations at multiple scales of regulation realized at different periods of time. To illustrate this, I would like to show you our collection of regulations on residential development in Amsterdam's um, metropolitan region. These regulations are issued by 
national, provincial, municipal, and metropolitan region authorities, so differently, from 2000 onwards. And as you could see in this dynamic uh, picture, it's quite a bit of regulation in the city to control housing development issued through time. So for this talk and also the publication, we focused on the residential development to illustrate the complexity. And you can imagine if you would uh, include other property uh, sectors, it would become even more complex picture. However, to understand the institutional infrastructure of uh, residential regulation, I suggest to go a step further than just policy analysis. I suggest that to provide a comprehensive analysis, we should read the city through actor landscapes in relation to the institutional network of regulations. Here, actor landscapes mean shortly the collection of actors and their dynamic behaviors within a specific institutional context. They contain the assemblages of actors, their characteristics, operational, financial, organizational, etc., and their locational and strategic behavior in cities. These characteristics and behavior are also embedded in wider economic and regulatory processes. And again, if you can imagine the variety, the diversity within the property industry, even within the same uh, actor category, like for instance, institutional investors, you can imagine this landscape is not very easy to uh, read. Also, their behaviors are not easy to follow. These complex networks of actors and their relations are regulated by institutions to co-produce the built environment in pieces and bits, as you can see in this illustrative project on the right-hand side. Each one of these projects mushroom in the city and they are realized through regulatory and contractual relations between different actors at diverse layers of governance. These projects scattered through the city forming a hybrid landscape of governance. In this respect, it is also important to understand each project through its context of relations. Using a relational approach, as I will explore in a bit, enables understanding of actors and their behavior within uh, the underlying financial and regulatory infrastructure, linking them in these complex and dynamic governance environments. If we zoom into an illustrative project, we can observe complex institutional relations between the public and private sector actors and communities. I call these institutional assemblages pockets of micro-regulation practices. And again, looking to Amsterdam's residential urban development, we can see in each of these colorful dots that you see on this map, that there is a complex set of institutional relations forming these pockets of micro-regulation practices throughout the city, establishing a wider complex network of relations, rules, formal and informal deals, et cetera, et cetera. Coming back to the idea of fragmented governance architectures, we can also notice the lack of suitable frameworks in the wider planning and urban studies fields. Governance studies provide some interesting frameworks uh, to explain these large-scale um, uh, processes. For example, uh, the large-scale administrative bodies such as the European Union or administrative complexities such as human rights regulation are also um, in this category of large-scale uh, bodies. Frank Biermann, who works on global sustainability governance, and Philip Patberg, who works on environmental politics and governance, they work together and predominantly use the term governance architectures, referring to these large-scale institutional infrastructures uh, under these uh, matters. So, Bringing this term into urban studies, we find the fragmented governance architectures as a useful framework to analyze 
the underlying infrastructures of hybrid neoliberal governance formulations and all these scattered policy interventions and investments in the city. Relational approaches, as I referred earlier, are more and more used to understand the complex intersections between property market actor behavior and urban regulation. They provide a better understanding of underlying governance mechanisms in this complex system. The urban studies literature, as you can see here, um, provides several ideas to accommodate relational approaches to understand the regulation through relational positions of market actors, suggesting to read the actor landscapes in cities as social constructs. Within this framework, let's look back into the map of Amsterdam's housing plans. Here in each colored area, different um, sets of actors, organizations, etc., interact uh, with each other based on unique sets of regulations and institutions. At the same time, the volumes of investment increased and decreased accordingly, while more regulations were issued to deal with the housing production if you look into the different crisis periods. As you can see in this figure, we looked into three different periods uh, of time. My colleagues Richard Ronald and Cody Hostenbach have been looking at this kind of regulation of housing in Amsterdam and call this as a state-initiated revival. It's a partial outcome of the restructuring of the urban housing market in the Netherlands, and they conceptualized this as a regulated marketization, whereby market forces are not being simply unleashed, but given more leeway in some regards and matched by new regulations. Also, the new Dutch national law, Omgevingswet, maybe you have heard about it, will add to this discussion as it aims to simplify the spatial regulations for project development and to make it easier to start new projects. So by looking into four policy domains in relation to residential production, namely housing, social housing, financial and spatial regulations, we categorize the re residential regulations using Adams and Tistel's framework to look at Amsterdam's uh, regulation of uh, housing market. Here, regulations are categorized from national to local scales of government by operationalizing the idea that they target shaping, regulating, stimulating, and capacity building the market. And that's the work of Adams and Tistel that we use in the background. Here, shaping regulations uh, refer to their characteristics to set the broad context of market transactions. Regulating regulations constrain and control the decision-making environment. Stimulating regulations expand the decisions by facilitating the market activity. And capacity-increasing regulations enable the development actors to operate more effectively. We analyzed 69 policies, laws, decrees, and governmental visions that we put together. And we were, uh, th these were valid at least until um, May 2019. We categorized all regulations by year of issue and scope, and then systematically analyzed their relationship to the market activity to do this analysis. After comparing diverse framings of the property industry in the written documents, we then returned back to our interview transcripts because we interviewed also lots of uh, property market actors and policy um, officials uh, to compare the narrative framings. We consistently moved between these regulatory analysis, interview data and narrative analysis in order to critically reflect on and verify our own observations. So what I'm going to show you is the abstract re, uh, result of this complex analysis. So Amsterdam's residential uh, property production, uh, as you will see in categorized uh, through regulations in this figure, is affected by a range of public sector regulations in thematic areas, as I listed before, housing, social housing, 
finance and spatial planning. Uh, you can see that uh, housing and uh, housing is the highest, biggest uh, area of um, uh, policy uh, frameworks, while social housing and finance equally um, uh, big with each other and spatial planning is a bit less. These regulations mostly tie directly into spatial makeup of the city by stipulating where, how, and what type of residential developments can be built in, in the city, in Amsterdam. Others, especially the fiscal regulations, for example, governing mortgages, taxes, and investment vehicles, impact the type of organizations involved in these processes. So after this background, I want to move into my analysis here um, by focusing on these residential regulation. Uh, we operationalize the in institutional structure in relation to the regulations uh, around the housing production, as I mentioned before. This exercise enabled us to see the factors that lead to fragmentation of the underlying institutional infrastructure. We group them under three factors, and I believe that these are quite universal factors, not only uh, for Amsterdam, but valid for many other cities as well. First of all, we observe the regulations uh, targeting divergent state market relations. Here, the involvement of new private sector actors and increasing market dependency create the need for more governance arrangements to regulate them, increasing, of course, the complexity of a regulation uh, landscape. Secondly, there is an ever complexifying organizational and institutional transformation taking place. Uh, I'm going to talk about that as well in a minute. And finally, we notice also the various regulations and narratives shape actor interactions and policy processes creating a, a fuzzy narratives because they don't 100% match to each other. So starting with the first set of characteristics, fragmentation through divergent regulations, um, analyzing the regulations, we noticed that various regulatory contradictions across uh, different scales of governance took place. We noticed local national policy tensions and contradictions, for example. For instance, while local planners are better positioned to steer the production of new housing, they are not able to directly intervene when investors buy up existing units. This is because most of the financial or fiscal and social housing regulations were enacted at the national level, whereas the city's regulatory powers lie mainly in spatial planning. Moreover, while the city of Amsterdam pulls efforts to control residential investments, the national government actively promotes housing in the Netherlands as an investment opportunity at different levels. So their narratives, but also their policy actions do not match with each other 100%. Our interviews, especially with the big market actors, highlighted increasingly complex and even inconsistent and uncertain policy dimensions. Market actors uh, told us that they expect more clarity and consistency to be able to make their calculations while the city authorities dynamically change the policy agendas to find the best ways to deal with the increasing need for affordable housing. So this is a bit of a chicken egg situation going on in there. Market dependency requires more flexibility to adjust conditions to changing needs, but changing policy agendas, priorities, and rules in this complex regulatory environment increase the uncertainties for the market actors at the same time. Secondly, looking to organizational structure, we can see Amsterdam City has a very crowded organizational body with about 15,000 civil servants and 4,000 external consultants working for this relatively small metropolitan city. There are many administrative decisions and independent policy directions accommodated in this 
actually very well organized system. However, there are multifaceted relationships among policy officials and between them and property market actors at the same time. In this crowded administrative system, the residential property production at the municipal level involves multiple administrative divisions. For instance, the city's land and development division is responsible for tenders, land lease arrangements, and contracts with private sector parties. The planning and sustainability division is in charge of zoning plans and wider spatial planning visions. Meanwhile, the housing division creates citywide housing policies. Furthermore, um, the emphasis on, for example, project-driven development is reflected in the remit of the city's project management office, PMO, which provides municipality-wide expertise across projects, processes, and program management. The, uh, internally, the PMO hires specialists from several divisions from the interdisciplinary project teams within the city. And these include planners, urban designers, as well as land lease and legal experts who draw up contracts to manage the land development projects throughout the city. So even though efforts are made to bridge divisional discrepancies and encourage collaboration within the city, the involvement to, uh, of so many public sector actors causes, of course, inconsistencies. Because also, as our public sector interviewees indicated that it's quite difficult for them to have an overview in this picture. As one of our interviews indicated, the problem of the municipality is that it has multiple voices as a result of this complexity, which of course adds to the confusion. This is a rapidly changing policy environment taking place in changing market dynamics, of course. Our interviews, interviewees also indicated that documents and master plans became very abstract, containing changeable visions, valid only for a very short period of time. Some interviewees, even including the public officials, admitted that it is at times useful to read older policy documents that are more directive than the regular ones today. Interviewees also expressed their wish for more guidance and leadership, even stating that the ideological orientation of those within political powers uh, doesn't matter as long as concrete and stable directions are given. And finally, looking to the narratives, we noticed a shift in the role of the public sector from housing provision to residential development uh, property production. For instance, uh, earlier documents such as the National Housing Act were predominantly framed around public housing provision. In the early 2000s, however, advisory documents submitted to the Dutch government uh, started to frame the social housing stock as an asset. In response to the economic downturn created by the 2008 economic uh, crisis, new national regulations were issued to encourage and accelerate building and permit procedures by reducing the weight of bureaucracy and easing the initiation of projects. And actually the act, the Omgevingswet that I referred before, is a product of these efforts because they seem to be successful in the eyes of the local policymakers. Secondly, our discourse analysis on regulations show that property industry actors are either uh, presented as public sector allies or as threats to the public interest, providing conflicting views expressed by diverse organizational bodies and sometimes even within the same institutional organizational body. And finally, adding to the fuzziness of the uh, policy narratives, opinion is mixed regarding political agendas. Several interviewees 
sensed a gap between the professional planning norms that define legal aspects of spatial development, like for instance, zoning decisions, and political agendas in terms of their aims, numerical targets, and implementation, making it quite difficult to see, again, the bigger picture. Political pressure pushes narratives on numerical targets at the expense of principles and rules that frame the provision of housing in the city of Amsterdam. All these, le uh, all these lead uh, to what one interview we called a hectic agenda without an overview, adding to the fragmented architecture of governance. The level of political fragmentation is very much related to the system's incapacity or inability to deal with the complexities of multi-actor governance. Coming to my conclusions, I would like to use um, Campbell et al's article, which invites us to stepping aside from standard analysis to investigate the overlooked choices. So our study of looking to the in, uh, regulations in relation to the actor behavior, especially from the property act, uh, market actors, is an attempt to do this, to investigate the overlooked choices and to see the bigger picture. Our research shows that without strong and consistent public sector leadership, this fragmentation is likely to increase. New analytical tools and approaches are needed to understand these complex fragmented architectures, combining wider economic and policy dynamics uh, with actor behaviors in order to step aside from these standard analysis. And of course, again, as I underlined before, understanding the property market actors and their behavior is not easy because there is an enormous variety of actors. And of course, they also differ from each other in terms of their behavior. Local government um, regulations targeting to control new property development may not largely influence the behavior of larger international uh, actors, investors, for example, who are investing on existing stock as national regulatory trends stimulate their activities. The case of Amsterdam shows us that. So these kind of local attempts stay actually powerless without strong collaboration with national authority. Coming to the last words that I would like to add to this lecture, what is more important to understand is investor strategies when developing regulations, actually. Understanding who and what actually shapes the city requires attention to these multiple dimensions of investor characteristics and their interplay. Here, I argue that this knowledge will empower local policymakers to develop more targeted regulations to shape, stimulate, regulate, and build capacity in the property market, again, in uh, reference to Adams and Tistel's uh, framework. However, of course, doing that requires local governments to have the willingness to learn the property market dynamics, its actors and behavior, also for us academics who are critical to property market dynamics to open our eyes and try to understand the variety within the property industry markets in relation to regulation in order to write good regulations, but also structure the city around them. I think with that, I will thank you for listening to my lecture and uh, I will give the floor to Laura. Thank you very much. Thank you. Well, thank you, Tuna. And as you already said, now the floor is up for you, Laura. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, Tuna, for this fascinating presentation. And you had so many interesting insights. And as Matthias at the presentation said at the beginning, uh, the topic is so present in Germany 
today that I'm sure that everyone also such um, people in the audience which maybe don't work in uh, very close in the topic and so on have um, also a lot of inspiration in in your arguments and in the insights you give us from the Amsterdam um, example. Mm. I have been working in the issues of residential development for a time, as Matthias said. Mm. So I'm really delighted to make the beginning for the discussion uh, today to the lecture. And since I had the privilege to work and to be privileged to work in IRS in ERCNA and since October last year, I'm also very, very happy to be part of this international lecture today and to be here or there <laughs> again. Also, um, uh, the, yeah, the lecture is <laughs> online in this uh, strange uh, corona year. <laughs> are leaving. Um, I just wanted to correct um, Matthias in uh, one point of um, my presenting. And I'm not the leader of the State of Our Institute, which I looked at. It is the Institute for Urban Planning and Design. It is an English name. I also didn't <laughs> admire. And as it's led by Martina Baum, and my professorship is in this institution. So um, saying that, thank you. And tune up for the presentation and thank you, Matthias, and of course the IRS and Sarah for organizing and everyone for inviting me to this international lecture. As I said, um, I'm very interesting in the topic and I, and I had, well, had directly many, many questions to your <laughs> presentation, but um, before I turn to the questions, I just, want to highlight um, some arguments, three arguments maybe, and um, that you may, and that I, um, from a very subjective point of view, think uh, they are crucial. The first of the these arguments, which is um, an implicit argument, you didn't make the argument as such, but um, I think that the most of research on property-led development and um, market-led uh, urban transformation has focused um, on big or mega projects and, and on and topics on, or examples that are not, in my view, not the common or the bulk of urban transformation in cities. And I think this kind of research or that <laughs> kind of research um, give us researchers uh, an explicit or implicit view on urban transformation and on development uh, and developers and on governance and the governance of that. And as you showed, um, this is not just the, the um, usual, but the very um, usual urban transformation way are a lot of very small projects and developers working in this map you <laughs> very now show everyone with its pocket um, of governance and regulations and, and so on. So um, I think the first um, point I want to highlight is that um, not just um, the very Mm, well-known projects, the very big projects, are examples of a transformation into um, entrepreneur, entre <laughs> entrepreneurial uh, ways of um, governance and of um, market-related ways of planning and transforming the city. Um, but that there are also in every one of these small um, projects and in the, um, in the addition of these ways, not only because of each of them, but as you say, this kind of um, mm, addition, this kind of completely mm, complex and not transparent um, 
and single regulations for each project in each development um, is changing and makes the not existing um, blue, um, how do you say, um, the, 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 the um, structure of this kind of um, entrepreneurial um, urban transformation. I think the second point I want to highlight um, and um, it's related to this and we saw it also very clear in, in the presentation is um, how important it is to break in into the details on relationships, on regulation and on the narratives. Um, and this is not just to have a more accurate way of understanding um, these processes, but also um, to understand that growth regimes and, and all the ways we call um, um, neoliberal um, urban policies, um, that they are not uniform and they are not unitary. And they are also not given, but they are dynamic, they are fragmented as you um, call it, they're sometimes contradictory and they are on the one hand, very difficult to grasp because they are changing and differentiated and so on. Also because the method is very difficult, um, uh, but also that the, um, ways to deal with this has somehow probably to change or we have to think um, about how we can deal with this kind of structures that are, are not unitary, are not um, so clear as the maybe formal literature um, explained. And the last point I wanted to mention is um, the quest a question you um, made or the, the um, focus in the article uh, you mentioned um, about accountability. And this is also related with my interest on questions of the public interest and the public good. Um, so you showed also that this had um, implications and it is not just for the processes of urban transformation as such and to the questions how to create um, a kind of transformation which is um, mm, with, mm, is accordingly with the necessities and of the mm, a citizen, citizenship and so on, but also um, this um, changes the way how um, accountability, how the responsibilities um, at the level of governance, at the level of planning um, work and um, shaping from a um, quite um, um, ethic based and understandable of um, um, accountability to a ways of accountability which are related to each of these ones pockets. Uh, what does it mean which are much more um, um, connected to questions if the contracts are working and who is uh, if um, the I don't know the times um, in the um, realization are working and so on and less on um, questions of uh, the necessities or the how to control and uh, the public sphere also in these um, in these um, projects or they um, ways of regulation. So it has implications in the, in my way, um, in my view, um, in the, um, what does it mean um, 
the legitimation of urban policy and of course of planning as part of a welfare state. And as you say, if it's willing to do so, <laughs> what, how do the municipalities understand themselves <laughs> and as part of a welfare sp uh, state or not? Mm. Of course, we could also look at uh, the methodological challenges, this kind of research, and I hope and also many of uh, um, the researchers in the audience were also inspired um, mm, with your approach, um, going deeper in very um, specific contracts and, and um, regulations. And, and trying to find the more and uh, the most detailed uh, level under these structural um, understandings and, and modes of governance. As Matthias said in the presentation, um, we have, uh, so we see a lot of parallelities, I think, in the um, case of Amsterdam. So I said, the three points I wanted to highlight now, I wanted to do um, some of the parallelities I see because I think it's also interesting um, for the audience um, to have this in mind. And also, I don't know, Tuna, how familiarized you are with the German case. Maybe I hope it is also interesting for you. Um, Definitely. <laughs> and as Matthias at the beginning said, um, the main narrative in their German, and I speak um, explicitly from their national level, um, the main narrative to deal with the housing crisis in Germany is um, trying, uh, they say always, bow and bow and bow and we have to build and build and build. So to um, extend the amounts of housing units, um, that are build, being built. Um, nevertheless, which kind of housing units uh, they are, which kind of developers they build them, if are, are mostly and um, for profit and so on. And um, I think it is important um, to make clear in the discourse that it is um, not the point how many units are built, but also to look at which kind of developers are behind of this, which kind of regulation um, um, are um, connected with the, the kind of developers and um, possibilities of development in each case. And there is also a parallelity in, in the point you made between the principal goals or narratives at the national level and in the municipality um, in that we see that the national level has a very big emphasis in the questions of, um, of investment and of um, making also um, a financial asset of selling the land, for example, whereas in the municipal level, there are more questions behind this kind of policies. Um, also, you, as you very good said, there is very contradictory um, the different interests and um, targets and, and her goals and imaginaries also in the or uh, in the municipal level. Um, I think the municipal level in Berlin, which is uh, the <laughs> reference for us in Erkner, um, um, has token um, some different kinds of policies in the last years. Nevertheless, um, the um, um, position of the national level um, has been strengthened in the last days um, 
because of um, stopping the possibilities of Berlin, for example, in making um, rental price cuts in in the market in the um, private market sector, for example, rental market sector. Mm. Mm. Today in the newspaper, I read that um, this had been a new regulation at the national level um, to regulate the privatization of single rental units, um, which is a good <laughs> new on the one hand. On the one hand, this is together with other kinds of regulation, which um, um, make give the municipalities more possibilities um, to extend the land um, in order to create much more private development. And this, so we see also how the municipal and the national level are coming together, having different kind of um, intentions and of um, yeah, rationalities behind their um, different levels of governance and this. Okay, so this, I think there are many um, parallels in the example you gave and in the case of Berlin. Or, and I wanted to, um, to um, um, yeah, open the discussion with three or four questions and to you also I think that there are already some questions in the um and the tool um Matthias said and the first question I would like to make is um if we think on examples for example um on the Docklands that uh, Susan Feinstein um wrote um many years ago um I will ask to you do you think it's a new phenomenon on, or how the phenomenon is changing or is it just much more um, a question that maybe it was taking place uh, already, but um, you and your team is describing so accurately for the first time. I wanted um, you to hear about this. How do you think it has developed historically? Um, and I wanted also to ask you, um, mm, how could mm, or um, how extended you think it's the phenomenon? Mm, I was thinking in in the cases you explained, just the cases of um, Amsterdam um, here, and I think it's it's very, very extended. But in your article, um, you talk also about the case, for example, of Brazil. And do you think in an international level, these kinds of pockets of governance, you think is more question of single uh, arrange, uh, arrangements or how extended it is to every kind of um, project and um, probably as I, to me at least um, my hypothesis and the last question um, it's related to, the, to your last slide and um, yeah how can we deal with this um, and the one side uh, of course in order to um, to strengthen the public interest um, on the one hand um, the municipalities and the single um, um, pieces in the puzzle are making improvements um, in terms of contractual knowledge to know better how to deal in, in this pocket um, of relationships. But of course, this is at cost of a more broad understanding of accountability and of legitimation. And what do you think could be mechanisms to deal with the, this? So thank you.
you are muted, Mathieu. I see. I'm sorry. Uh, well, thanks, Laura. Do you know, would you like to respond right away? Yes. Okay. Yes. Then let's. Laura, thank you so you much. Uh, yes, thank you, Matthias. Uh, Laura, thanks very much for this very nice uh, evaluation. Uh, also, I really enjoyed uh, the comparison with Berlin and Germany because, uh, of course, our research goes in different countries, but this is the phenomena we are testing in Amsterdam. So I'm glad to hear that it makes sense also for the context, uh, which is very different. Um, your questions. First of all, city builders, Susan Feinstein, my uh, Bible, let's say, from my PhD years. And in this project, we keep discussing, we are looking at city builders 2.0 because of course we are in a new uh, era now. Um, what is different? First of all, I think financialization made a big difference. When Susan wrote the book and made the research, we were, just understanding the complex ways of thinking of the builders, the developers, basically. We didn't talk about the investors and all these uh, complex financial mechanisms behind them. It wasn't really that important. It was important and she was giving us why they failed and the companies had all these troubles in relation to finance. But they look like all these large projects having too much uh, greed and then failing uh, in the end. What happens today is financialization makes it possible even for a very little investor of a couple of million in the pocket, uh, even as an individual to go to the city and make investments the way they like. We don't even know who they are. So I think we are in a new era uh, of what Susan Feinstein uh, defined a more complex era, very similar in many senses, but I think the developers are very different today than um, let's say 90s. And also the attitude of local governments towards developers uh, changed dramatically. There is more collaboration, more acceptance, uh, even within the literature, even within the academy, there is more of trying to understand them because as when I was writing my PhD thesis, they were the enemies of the city building. They were all the reason for why everything went wrong. That way of looking at the property industry has also dramatically changed. So I think there's a very interesting research field here to understand this new landscape of investors, especially I'm underlining investors because their uh, actions, their way of behavior is very much related to the regulations and regulators. And I think for city um, policymakers, it's very important to understand this. Uh, I can talk about that uh, a bit longer uh, based on the questions, of course. It's a very interesting question. Uh, how extended is the phenomena? I think it is very extended. I mean, uh, also in that little map that I illustrated with all the you know, pockets are growing, you could see it in the tiny little bits of them, very complex relationships. We did look into small projects in, in the Netherlands, uh, also collected contracts from them. Uh, it doesn't mean that they are straightforward. They are very complex understandings in them, um, uh, as well as of course in large projects. Um, there are different works uh, you may uh, remember uh, works of uh, Mike Racco on the Olympic Park in, uh, in London, the contractual relationships, how complex they are, thousands of contracts in just one project. So I think that phenomena is quite extended. But the pockets of micro-regulation practices, well, they are maybe not that micro after all, but uh, they are very extended. And how do we deal with this? Um, your last question, I think also connected to your first question, we need to understand this landscape. And the reason why we are focusing on this, the, the project we are doing, the VIC project, has different, uh, of course, stages. The regulation article that I shared with you, it's the stage where we looked into regulations uh, predominantly. We moved on then to look into the property market actor behaviors. And we did analysis on uh, property investors. And that's also a publication coming up, I actually referred also in the, uh, in the presentation, where we used a framework to understand multidimensional readings of the property investment uh, landscape. Without doing that, 
I think it is impossible to develop policies that are targeting this complexity because the market itself is very complex. It has always been complex, but the place of the policymaking was very different. First of all, we had planning. I mean, we had master planning. When I was urban planning student, bachelor, I learned that we would plan cities and we did see the future of the cities. We knew where the city would develop, for example. We had physical understandings of which directions the physical uh, trajectories will take place. Now we have some understandings of which directions the city may grow, but it may grow and may not grow because we have visions. We have strategies, we have very flexible understandings of the future in order to accommodate this complexity because we don't know what to expect. If you make very strict regulation and zoning plans as we did in 90s, then you block the investment channels. And with the welfare state not being interested in or able to, I think together, um, financing the local governments, Local governments are completely dependent on these channels. So they can't just make regulations to block everything. They have to find this very thin balance between on the one hand controlling them, on the other hand taking from them to turn it into wider public interest. It's a big gamble. Um, so how to deal with this complexity? I think new ways of understanding the market the local governments have to develop, and they do that. Uh, in this presentation, I didn't talk about it, uh, but the city of Amsterdam uh, has a kind of uh, organization, because they are aware of the complexity of the, the animal they have in their hand. It's a, it's a very dynamic animal. Um, so they try to link different project managers' activities together to have a wider picture. However, there are, I think, fundamental issues here because what the policymakers want, I mean, what I mean by policymakers, the politicians with their political agendas and what the city authorities with their planning agendas uh, want, they don't necessarily match to each other. That is the major problem, if you ask me, more problematic than the property industry not being able to deal uh, with the uh, uh, municipality. In my view, municipalities are able to control the property industry if they want to. They can actually do it because they have the regulatory power, right? If you find the right balance, you can develop new forms of regulation like the Dutch uh, uh, national government is now trying with this new law in order to create a kind of guided flexibility, if you like. However, the problem between the political targets and the planning targets, that I don't know how to solve that problem. I think that's a everlasting issue we need to talk about. Um, yeah, I think I will stop here to give some chances to other questions. Well, great, thanks, uh, Tuna. I feel I really feel tempted to ask my own questions, but um, being a moderator, uh, I will let well I will give the floor to other people's questions, and we have two on the chat, and I think both care about uh, the relation between the government's fragment governance fragmentation you describe uh, and the physical output. So one question from Francesca Ranali Ranai. I hope. I pronounced it correctly. Ranali. Ranali. Sorry, I'm really sorry for that. Um, is that she said that she encountered fragmentation also in the spatial and physical design of various areas in Amsterdam and the metropolitan region, uh, often missing a connection and strategic vision of main public spaces and uses. And she wonders how you would explore the relation between the governance relations you describe and this physical output, which is also experienced as very fragmented and fragmented and problematic. Um, do you have any idea on that? Yes, I, I, do. I mean, it's a little bit uh, connected to the, um, the answer I gave to Laura's first uh, question. We still do have plenty. I mean, we have a, a very good tool in our hands called spatial planning. We just have to reorganize the idea of spatial planning as spatial governance 
in order to look at space through social relations, and I mean implementing it to the municipal level, I think municipalities will have to go back to more um, uniting, more over bridging forms of master plan making than very bold, very open visions, uh, in my view. And it may sound a little bit strange, but um, during the interviews that we did with the property investors, believe it or not, this is also what they want. They told us, we rather have more rigid regulations than this, because this <laughs> is so open that because they make calculations, right? I mean, investors are calculating actors. They want to see the future. They want to make some estimations in order to calculate their profits. In order to provide that, you need to provide a, a regulation that lasts through a certain period of time. But the city changes their mind after a year. They, there is a vision. And there is maybe a vision for the next five years, but within a year time, a new regulation appears, a new tool appears. They change the vision. So of course, if you do those things, the calculations are done um, to the you know rubbish bin. They have to make new calculations. Um, so I'm not saying that the municipality should go into rigid ways of spatial plan making, but there can be more, I think, certainty about what the city wants. And that's a very difficult thing to know. What do you want? Tell us, do we go to the north-south direction? Do we want a, a more polycentric development? Remember the old master plan making rules. I think we need to get some things out of those rules and implement to these more flexible forms of plan making. So I think my answer to Francesca's question is spatial, uh, spatial governance. Uh, taking care of spatial development in relation to uh, actor behavior and actor demands. So it's a co-production of plans rather than um, a one-way street kind of plan making process. Including, of course, the property industry actors, not only communities, but seeing them as part of the plan making process. Well, thank you. I know I shouldn't do this as a moderator, but um, I think I will take the liberty to, you know, pick up on this again. Um, I mean, if I get you correct, then what you're demanding is basically that we should have more coherent governance strategies, which would end up in, you know, frameworks like master plans. But I keep wondering how realistic is that actually? Um, because what you describe actually obviously is lots of tensions between different levels of government, um, inconsistencies in decision-making, also knowledge gaps between different departments. And I think, I mean, that's in the nature of governance already for a long time. But the situation we now face in many West European and Northern countries is a, an increasingly fragmented political landscape, uh, very, unpredictable uh, voters behavior. So what I would actually expect is that we would see even more fragmentation of strategies between different levels of government. Um, and I think Laura pointed to the situation in Berlin, you know, where a red, red, green government at the city level tries to introduce tough rental regulations and is stopped by the federal level, right? So I wouldn't expect, you know, given the political landscape that we face that this societal background is about to change. So I keep wondering who actually should be, I mean, why should we hope that there is gonna be more coherence and more consistency among decision makers? Um, so who would deliver uh, this master, master plan framework? Well, uh, first of all, Matthias, I'm hearing myself. Oh. Yes. Uh, I... Yes, it's better now. Um, well, first of all, to clarify, I'm of course not demanding a master plan as we did. I mean, we also know that it doesn't work. Uh, I can give you the example from Istanbul, for example. For years, they worked on a massive master plan 
of a city like Istanbul, forget Amsterdam. I mean, imagine cities like uh, Rio, Sao Paulo, Istanbul, you know, uh, they are impossible to make master plans. Bef you finish the master plan, and when you finish the master plan, the world already has changed like 10 times more. So it's, it's, that's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is master plan like more long-term and stable policy directions where in which you can accommodate decisions and provide certainty. Because what the market needs is leadership. What the market wants from the uh, uh, policymakers, urban policymakers to say, this is what we have in mind. It can be a rigid framework. It can be, a, I think it, it has to be a flexible framework, but within that flexible framework, directions. And uh, again, Amsterdam, of course, has the advantage of being a small metropolitan city. I mean, it's not a very big city, right? It's a, you can walk within Amsterdam, forget even bike, you can walk from one uh, corner of Amsterdam to other in, in two hours, I think. It's a small city. But if you look at the wider area, the metropolitan region, then you can see it more like a metropolitan city including all those suburban towns and development areas around the city, which all work on their own things. The city of Amsterdam uses the metropolitan uh, region authority as an independent policymaking authority. And metropolitan region, Amsterdam region, MRI, um, it's, um, it is trying to establish these, uh, let's say, concrete, um, characteristics of the plan without providing a very rigid master plan. They are trying to do that. And I think if they succeed that, that's a kind of thing we like, we need. But again, if you look into a framework like, uh, or a city like uh, Istanbul or Rio or Sao Paulo, I'm not very sure whether that would work that easily. You will have to divide tasks. I mean, it's a, it's a very complex issue today. Awareness, I think, is the number one um, necessity here. Awareness of what is happening in the market. Because without knowing that, whatever you develop will become powerless. Great point. Well, here we have another question. Um, and that question is, uh, what what is, is about the chances that this fr the fragmentation you describe opens up for uh, local groups or networks for civil society organization uh, to create more rooms to be visible um, and especially in countries where entrepreneurial agendas are on on, on the up yeah, it's a very good question um Within the entrepreneurial uh, city discussions, usually the critique is put on the property industry actors um, because of course they are profit oriented. However, what we see is that the communities are also pushed to become entrepreneurial. In other words, if you are a neighborhood uh, or if you are a citizen in a neighborhood who are passive, who are not active citizens, who are not able to organize yourselves, who are not able to make a lot of noise, you are not systematically uh, able to um, uh, conquer the system, then you have no chance of having your voices heard. So in this system, in my view, um, citizens, and also, again, the new, new law, the Omgevingswet, the Coming Up uh, Act in the Netherlands, openly asks for it, openly asks the citizens to organize themselves and come up with ideas to the government, to the local governments, to say, we want to experiment on this idea in that space. We want to do that. But to do that, you need to, self, uh, you need to have the self-organization capacity. And uh, knowing from resilience studies, uh, self-organization capacity is a very difficult thing, especially if you are living in a problematic neighborhood, let's say a neighborhood where people are not well connected. In a coherent neighborhood where everybody likes each other, 
living in a harmonious life is not a problem. But in a problematic neighborhood where you have different uh, tension groups, imagine them organizing themselves to go to the local authorities to say, hey, this is what we want. So of course, this form of policymaking requires entrepreneurialism. And in my view, it's going to create new forms of uh, exclusion in the society. Those who are passive, those who are not able to organize themselves will be excluded from this, these discussions between the private sector, the municipality and other citizens. So there are new dangers in there. Can I uh, make uh, one more question, maybe also um, related a um, little bit to this? And I was thinking about, um, so this, this very uh, mm, mm, numbers of um, pockets of um, mm, contracts and of organization relationships mm, are very opaque. opaque. They are not transparent to the people, to the people maybe um, seeing afterwards uh, the uh, hopes and, and necessities not being um, realized. And do you think that maybe questions of transparency will in the contracts, if um, we would say, uh, excuse me, but contracts with public agencies, also with um, semi, <laughs> semi public uh, agencies at every level, um, thinking about the uh, highway um, <laughs> questions in Germany, also has to be transparent, for example. And, and could this kind of uh, policy be? Um, yeah, help to um, increase the outputs of this kind of projects and the outcomes and also um, the ways, ways to deal with legitimacy and so on. This on the one side. On the other side, um, in the city of Berlin was um, making and a standardized contract and in order to capture parts of the surplus rent increments in development, in bigger developments or some kind of developments. And um, it was very important as they implemented this to create a, a standardized contract because um, other way, um, every, so each municipality in Germany has to ne negotiate uh, as how um, if they can capture surplus values and in which amount and so on. And in order not to negotiate with each developer and to be um, in difficult power relationships also with the development, it was necessary for the city of Berlin to make a standard contract. And I think that was the end of a very big discussion about how to deal with this. Mm, so also mm, one point of transparency and the other point, maybe a standardization of contracts could be also a kind of solution. Yeah, it's again, very nice questions, uh, Laura. T transparency is a big issue and I'm afraid it will stay as a big issue. I mean, under normal conditions, uh, contracts are transparent, right? That's why we did that research project, believing that we are able to see the contracts. And when we started the research, um, I, I was uh, then working uh, with a, a postdoc, uh, uh, Martin van der Hoek, and uh, he was specialized in this and he went in to the market to collect contracts. Believe it or not, even the municipalities weren't willing to share anything. We could only get the contracts in our hands when we softly threatened them saying, okay, then we will have to go to the court because you have a right to see them, but you can go to the court and say, I want to see this contract and court can decide and then you will see the contract. So when we said that we are going to start that procedure, then we start getting the contracts. Um, and then some of them were even um, censored. And of course, 
on the one hand, it's a big problem. On the other hand, put yourself into the private sector company. Of course, they don't want certain characteristics of their company deals and so on to be visible. I mean, you have intellectual property rights, privacy, all kinds of complex issues in this contractual form of urban development. That's why, uh, of course, you, we have to question why do we have contractual urban development? Why is planning document not uh, enough for this? Why in the past, um, well, let me put it in that way. Zoning plan today is the final step of what uh, happens uh, in the whole, in the entire process. You go through the negotiations. There's a kind of plan in the background. You agree, the contract is written. And then on the basis of the contract, you develop the thing. And finally, the plan is produced in order to legitimize and coming to your legitimacy thing, the plan. So these two things, uh, I think the process, the entire process basically, yeah, turned turned around. So I think that's that's a problem. There we need to, and I mean, cities like Amsterdam, again, small municipality. I mean, think of London dealing with the Olympic games uh, contracts. Nobody knew who is responsible for what at the end of the day. Nobody can have an overview about responsibilities. Uh, I mean, forget about public interest. Uh, that's why we wrote that article on public accountability, because that you can measure. Public interest is something more philosophical, you know, we, we can come to that point. But uh, even in the measurable accountability uh, measures, you cannot see them because of these complexities uh, of uh, opacness. So, uh, yes, standard contract standardization may be a, a solution to this problem, but then, yeah, it doesn't match to the to each situation because each situation is very different. And also the city of Amsterdam uh, interviews showed us that um, they learn a lot out of this. In the city now, uh, they made lots of mistakes. They also admit, uh, but doing the mistakes with the contracts, they learn how to make better contracts. So the, stun, the, the contract they see is a very dynamic document. It's not a standardized contract. And, at the end of our research with Martine, that's what we also agreed. We published on that in Urban Studies, um, that uh, there is always a leeway in the contracts, even though they look very strict and rigid, the oral deal between the municipality and the developer is still the more legitimate deal than the contract itself. Because if the developer ruins that relationship, he or she knows that there will not be another contract. So still there are all these gray zones between informality and formality in plan making process, I think plays a, a big role. So I'm not very sure whether standardization will solve this issue. It will create other sets of legal, I think battles and fights in between. It's a very fascinating topic to talk about. <laughs> Absolutely, absolutely. And then I would love to continue talking with you about that for an hour or so, or even better for a longer time over a coffee or another kind of drink. Um, unfortunately, time is running out. Um, so the only thing I can do now is to thank both of you for a stimulating and, and thought provoking discussion. And I hope um, we'll have the chance to continue that on, on another occasion. Um, and thanks to the audience uh, for being with us today. Um, I hope we'll see each other again, not only virtually, but in real space. Um, and wish you a nice weekend. Thank you, Matthias. Thank you, Laura. It was, a, it was an absolute pleasure. And Thank Sarah, you, Tuna and Matthias and Sarah for organizing. Thank absolutely. you. Absolutely. Well, thanks. Bye. Bye. Good weekend. Bye. Bye.